Here are all the GCSE chemistry required practicals for AQA. First, some tips. Remember that in many of these investigations, there's an independent variable, the thing you change, a dependent variable, the other thing that changes as a result, which you measure and controls. Variables that could change, but we keep them the same throughout in order to ensure that results are accurate. Always say what piece of equipment you use for each measurement. Don't just say measure the length of the object. Also add with a ruler or whatever you're using. That's a mark in itself. When it comes to safety, we always use goggles and often gloves when working with chemicals. State the flipping obvious. If you think, surely they don't want me to put that, put it down anyway. You never know what marks you might pick up. Talk about the accuracy of measurements. How will you reduce errors and uncertainties? For example, you get your eye in line with the measurement when using a ruler or measuring cylinder to reduce parallax error. Another classic thing you should put down is multiple or repeat measurements or readings to calculate a mean from. Finally, it's okay to write your answers in bullet point format. In fact, I recommend it as it helps you and the examiner keep track of how many different points are being made. Because I'm trying to fit loads in here, you might see me write abbreviated points for the sake of brevity, but when you write a point, do it in full. Make sure you use proper English. Don't start going all Tarzan like saying, heat liquid with fire. More like heat the water gently on a gauze on a tripod over a Bunsen burner flame. Also, don't forget that you can see me and others from Malmesbury Science doing these practicals for realsies on Malmesbury Education. Link is in the description. Let's go. Chem 1, making salt crystals. Nice and easy, we just take a base like copper oxide and an acid like concentrated sulfuric acid. A base essentially just means something that can neutralise an acid. We heat the acid first in a beaker, then add excess copper oxide. You can tell it's in excess when there's some of the unreacted powder at the bottom of the beaker. The neutralisation reaction makes copper sulphate solution. We filter the unreacted copper oxide out, then gently heat the solution in an evaporating basin over a beaker of water that's on a tripod above a Bunsen burner flame, and you're left with solid crystals of copper sulphate. Chem 2 Electrolysis Causing a chemical reaction using electricity We put the solution, say sodium chloride solution, in a beaker. We get two carbon electrodes, they're inert, they won't react, and we put them in the solution, making sure they don't touch, and we connect them with crocodile clips and cables to a power supply or battery. The electrode connected to the positive terminal, usually red, is the anode, negative, black, is the cathode. We have a mixture of Na+, Cl-, H+, and OH- ions. A positive ion, a cation, will be reduced at the cathode. A negative ion, an anion, will be oxidized at the anode. But which ones will do that? If the cation in solution is more reactive than hydrogen, it will stay in solution, and hydrogen will be reduced to make H2 hydrogen gas. This is what would happen with sodium chloride, because sodium is more reactive than hydrogen. If the positive ion is less reactive than hydrogen, say we had copper chloride instead, copper would instead be reduced at the cathode and we'd see it form on the surface of the anode. If the negative ion, the anion, is a halogen, which chlorine is here, they will be oxidised at the anode to make a gas. It would be chlorine gas here, Cl2. If it's not, say we had instead sodium sulphate, it's oxygen gas that's made at the anode instead. Chem 3. Temperature changes. We carry out a reaction in a polystyrene cup which is well insulated and a thermometer poked through a lid that sits on top. The cup can be put in a beaker for stability. Then we add the other reactant and place the lid on making sure the thermometer bulb is in the liquid and record the maximum temperature the solution reaches. This is our dependent variable. We repeat this with increasing volumes of the alkali, our independent variable. Eventually it will be in excess, so the maximum temperature will start to decrease as the same amount of energy being released is being spread through a greater volume of solution. We can draw two lines of best fit for the rise and fall in these maximum temperatures. Where they meet tells us how much of the alkali was needed to neutralise the acid. Chem 4. Rates of reaction. There are two practices we can do to observe the rate of reaction. The first is fairly simple. If a gas is made from a reaction, we can do it in a conical flask with a tube leading to an inverted measuring cylinder filled with water, allowing us to measure the volume of gas made every 10 seconds, say. We can plot this against time to see the reaction curve. The gradient at any time is the rate at that time. We can then change a variable, say temperature or concentration, of a reactant to be our independent variable, and we can plot multiple curves on the same axes to compare them. The other prac involves a reaction between sodium thiosulfate and hydrochloric acid, which produces a product that causes the mixture to go cloudy. We can say the turbidity increases. We carry out the reaction in a conical flask over a piece of paper with a cross drawn on it. We use a stop clock to time how long it takes for the cross to disappear when we look from above the flask. That's our dependent variable. We can then change a condition, say temperature or concentration, for our independent variable, then plot the times against this. Chem 5. Chromatography. This allows us to separate the different solutes or other particles found in a mixture. 
we put the spot of the solution or another kind of mixture just above the bottom of a piece of chromatography paper. Filter paper also works. This is our stationary phase. We also draw a line across the paper at the same point in pencil. This will not move up the paper with the water and acts as our reference point for measurements later. We secure the paper to a rod so it hangs down in a test tube or beaker with a bit of distilled water in so the bottom of the paper just touches the water. The spot must not touch the water directly. We then wait for the distilled water to move to diffuse up the paper by capillary action, hence why it's called the mobile phase. This pulls particles in the mixture upwards too, with lighter particles moving further up the paper than heavier ones, so they separate out. We can then calculate the RF value, retention factor, by dividing the distance the solute moves by the distance the mobile phase, the water, moves by, again, these are both measured from the pencil line. We can then compare these RF values with known values for different substances, which helps us identify what's in our mixture. Chem 6, water purification. We just distill water to leave pure water. Distilled water is considered potable, that is drinkable, although that goes for any water with low enough levels of salt and microbes. We heat the water in a conical flask or round bottom flask with a tube going through a condenser or just to a beaker of ice. The colder temperature will recondense the water back into a liquid. Remember that removing salt from water through any method is given the term desalination. For triple, they expect you to also use your knowledge of flame and precipitate tests to identify metal and non-metal ions, in particular sodium and chloride ions. I'll explain these in a minute in Practical 8. Chem 7, neutralization. We can carry out a titration to determine the concentration of an acid if we know the concentration of the alkali is neutralizing or vice versa. We use a glass pipette to measure out a specific volume of the alkali and put in a conical flask, then add an indicator like methyl orange, which turns pink in the presence of an acid. Then we fill the burette up to the 0 cm cubed mark at the top and open the tap. You can do a rough titer or rough titration first by adding the acid quickly while swirling the flask. Once it turns pink, you know the alkali has been neutralized. You've likely overshot it, but this is just to give you an idea of what the volume needed is. Repeat this process, but close the tap so the acid is only being added a drop at a time when you get close to the volume from your rough titer. After each drop, swirl the flask. If it turns pink but returns to orange after swirling, it's not done. It's only once it stays pink does that give you the volume that was needed to neutralize the alkali. You need to use your knowledge of moles and stoichiometry of H plus to OH minus ions in the acid and alkali respectively in order to then calculate the unknown concentration in moles per decimeter cubed. Of course, this is just the moles of the acid or alkali used divided by the volume of the solution of water in decimeter cubed. Here's a sample calculation for sodium hydroxide and sulfuric acid. To see this explained, check out my separate titration video. Chem 8, identifying ions. We need to be able to identify various metal and non-metal ions found in compounds. These five metals can be identified using a flame test. We dip a piece of nichrome wire in a solution or a powder of the compound or in a sample of water from Prax 6 and place it at the edge of a Bunsen flame. Next, we can test for non-metal ions. To test for carbonate ions, add hydrochloric acid. If bubbles are made, we can collect the gas with a tube or pipette and put it in lime water. If it turns cloudy, it's carbon dioxide, showing that there must be carbonate ions present. To test for halide halogen ions, we add silver nitrate solution and nitric acid. If chloride ions are present, a white precipitate will form. Cream precipitate is a result of bromide ions, yellow, iodide. Adding hydrochloric acid and barium chloride will result in a white precipitate formed if there are sulfate ions present. If you've done a good job purifying your water from Prax 6, then you shouldn't see the positive tests for sodium or chloride ions. Leave a like and a comment if you found this helpful. Click on the cards to go to the Malmesbury Science playlist or the other card to go to the videos covering whole papers. See you next time.